over the last couple of weeks, we've been using the metaphor of a spotlight to say that a lot of the way that Mark tells the story is by using this sort of spotlight type imagery to imagine the performance of the drama of the Lord Jesus occurring on a stage. And at various times, he highlights certain people and certain characters so that the spotlight falls upon them. In chapter 12, we saw how the spotlight was on Jesus and how he handled this impending doom of his own death. And we saw that even though it looked like he was coming to a premature death, he was actually in control. He controlled when Judas was going to betray him. He knew about Peter. He knew that when he came as the king into Jerusalem, that in the end, those same people that shouted Hosanna and hallelujahs would also shout crucify him. But yet he still went through with God's plan, as we saw in Gethsemane. Last week, we saw that the spotlight actually turned from Jesus to us. It turned to groups of people who the crowd and pilot and the soldiers represent types of human characteristics where we ourselves could see us in those types of people, those who rejected Jesus, those who mocked Jesus, those who ignored him. And we saw that Jesus remained silent in the background whilst those in the foreground did their evil deeds. In today's passage, it's almost like the drama comes outside and the spotlight is outside shining from up on high and we get the spotlight from creation and the sun darkened or in more accurate terms a thunderstorm almost comes over all the land at that time of day to communicate something about God being in the spotlight what is his view about what he sees so God takes center stage for a period of time Jesus as well is in this spotlight and so the spotlight largely concerns the relationship between the father and the son. And then we can look upon that and see, well, why did Jesus behave this way? Why is God's attitude to his crucifixion like this? And so we're meant to see the big picture today of creation being really a symbolism for God's relationship with his own son, but then also God's relationship with us in humanity. And hopefully we'll see that together. Let me pray first, and then we'll come to that text for a few minutes, and then slowly work our way, or quickly work our way uh, through the next two as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we do come to your word, you may teach us afresh for those of us that Sandra reminded, we know the word so well, we know the story, we know how it ends. But teach us afresh what it means for Jesus to die upon that cross for the sins of the world. Amen. In your bulletin there, I have a slight outline that we'll uh, go through as well. I wonder if you notice, now this is also, if you've never read this passage before or not heard the story much, just how mundane the story actually is. It's told in a fairly simple way. We used to say that's because you didn't need to tell the ancient world what crucifixion meant they knew the gory details, and so Mark spares the gory details of what a crucifixion actually entails. But he doesn't spare the gory details, we'll see in a moment, of the relational dysfunction between Jesus and the Jews, we'll see in a moment from verse 27, nor does he spell, nor does he ignore the gory details upon the relationship between the Father and the Son. The only gory details he doesn't talk about is what it looks like for nails to go through human flesh and bone. He doesn't tell you us those details. In fact, the mundanity is its own humiliation. It's like we're so desensitized to crucifixion that Mark doesn't even have to bother talking about it. But I think he's also doing something slightly else. And that is the, the way the soldiers behave is the way we would expect soldiers who have crucified thousands of people to behave. It's the way that you might behave when you watch imagery on the evening news of the horrors that we've seen in the Ukraine or in the Yemen or in Sudan. Those horrors, as you sit and watch them, you become a bit desensitized. Remember, we're seeing the big picture. So Mark's like got the drama unfolding before us. And as we watch it as the audience almost, it doesn't sort of impress upon us. It's just so mundane. 
and they crucified him. So understated. And there's something else that communicates this mundane way of the text progressing. You can see a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, mentioned because of uh, those gentlemen being in Rome at the time of Mark's writing. We know that from another letter. Passing by on his way in from the country, he drew the short straw because Jesus had already gone through a type of trial, remember, with the flogging. Under certain circumstances, that flogging could kill people, depending on what they put on the tips of the whips. And they forced him to carry the cross because the Romans generally were uh, people who did carry out lots of executions. The erect part of the cross was already probably in place and you carried the length one yourself. You carry your own cross of which Jesus himself is relieved of that burden with this man. They brought Jesus, you can see, to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Now, look how many times as we read the next couple of verses, the word they is in the text. You know, I love a good pronoun. And here we have lots of them. And the aim really is to sort of distance ourselves and for the crowd and the soldiers to be distanced from the crucifixion. When you use the word they, you are distancing yourself from the people you're speaking about. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. That's a mild sedative in this case. And they crucified him. Who are the they? But they are the soldiers, aren't they? Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. You should get the picture that the soldiers are just doing their job. Just doing their job. Crucify Jesus today, crucify someone else next week, crucified 100 or so the week before. They're just doing their job. There's this mundanity in the brutality of what they're doing. Jesus is suffering this humiliation that many have gone through in the past, many will go through in the future, and people look upon without much surprise. It's a little bit like when people used to love going to see a crucifixion. Yes, go see a hanging, go see an electrocution. We find something macabre in them, absolute brutality inflicted upon others. But here it's so mundane, it doesn't even draw Mark even talking about it. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews, they crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. So the first number of verses, no emotion is there. They did this, they did that. It's like reading a year seven essay. Just very descriptive. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. It's so mundane. But yet, we know who's on the cross. But he doesn't communicate that reality yet the reality starts to kick in in verse 29 now i think what he's trying to say is something that we may know all too well and that is what sandra already has said at the start most of us here i suspect this is not your first ever church service nor good friday service if it is praise the lord that you're here but if it's not you know the story so well and what you become is just familiar with the text, don't you? You know how it's going to turn out. It's like going to watch the Titanic. It's a great movie, but you know the boat sinks. You know the Lord is dead, but you know he's raised again. And when you know the end of the story, it sometimes can mitigate the pain that the person's experiencing in the interim. And yet, we're supposed to not become so familiar with Jesus' death that we don't think about what it meant for him to die upon the cross. And what it does mean, yes, is the physical pain. But the other reason, as I mentioned, he minimizes that, is I think to focus on the next two bits, to highlight the pain and suffering, not so much of the physical pain, which no doubt would be excruciating. It's actually where the word excruciating comes from, crux, crucify. But it's to highlight the fact that the physical is actually secondary to the spiritual and emotional. And the first one, occurs in verses 29 through to 32. And we'll look at the second one in a moment. You can see, hopefully, this shift straight away. Now, nobody can hurt you like those who, who you used to know. The Romans don't care. Crucify Jesus, crucified Bob, crucified Fred. They don't care. They're all the same. But the Jews, they have a personal hatred. And so look at the shift in verse 29. There is now this brutality in humiliation. They're mocking, they're insulting him. 
Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. It's just so mocking. But again, you look at that and you could say, how terrible that a person seeing such pain could comment like that. And it's supposed to speak really about the human character that under certain circumstances, each one of us could be brutal in our humiliation of those who we once maybe cared for, who we once loved. And we know the worst type of infliction of pain is generally done by those who used to love you. You only can hurt those people who you used to love, apparently. And certainly the emotional pain is what is being absolutely demonstrated here because they used Jesus' own words against him. You said this, Jesus, but look at the reality. Mocking, hurtling, insults at him. And we're supposed to see the macabre nature of our own human characters in the way that the people react here. Now, remember last week I said that occasionally we would look at the way people behave, like Pilate and the soldiers, the crowd here, and say, Whew, I would be nothing like that. And it's not meant to be focusing on the actions of the crowd and say, I wouldn't do that. It's to focus on the motivations within the crowd and to say, my character could be like that. I have hated. I have felt anger towards people. Someone I once loved, I now have vitriol towards. And this is what's happening here. They themselves were brought low by Jesus, the teachers of the law. Jesus, he, they think, made him look small, the teachers. Jesus spoke to them and made them look like they were wrong, belittled the teachers. But who's going to be belittled now? Jesus, he's the belittled one. And when someone bullied you and you see them copping their just desserts, you find some macabre justice in that. Serve your right. You said you could do this, you liar. And so where is there any hope just in this text? You know the outcome and so you know the hope, but where is it here? So that we don't just, if you like, focus on the macabre nature only. Well, it's in the irony of the words used by Mark to convey the insults. If you've been with us over the course of Mark's gospel, you know that Mark did, does this a lot. That in the words of those who hate Jesus is actually the slither of hope for them and for us. Because if you actually read the phrases, you know that Jesus makes them come true. So you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Jesus did do that after his resurrection. The temple, in other words, is the place where you worship God. But where do you worship God now? In a temple, in a building, in a hall? No, in Christ. He destroyed the need to go to a place and replaced it with the need to go to a person himself. You can see the next one, the same way the chief priests mocked him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. But he can. He says, I lay my life down. I give it of my own accord. You are not killing me, Pontius Pilate. I lay my life down. I could save myself. But of course, he does not because he obeys the Father's will. And we'll see more of that in a moment. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the, now from the cross that we may see and believe. Jesus already said that even when someone gets resurrected from the grave in the Lazarus story at Abraham's bosom, they will not see and believe. In other words, seeing is not believing. Believing is having God speak to us about the reality of why Christ died. And we'll see more of that in a moment. We're going to have our next reading. So I'll invite uh, the reader to come up and read that. I think Jeff is, is here. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. the spotlight upon all humanity reflecting a passage from amos chapter 8 verse 9 which says in that day declares the sovereign lord i will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight why verse 10 
I would turn your religious festivals into mourning. This is the Passover. So in other words, the Jews themselves thought that the Passover brought them, which it had done for centuries, into a continual relationship with God as the lamb or bulls paid the sin of humanity as a sacrifice. And Jesus is going to say, I'm going to take that job upon myself. But we won't see that for a few verses yet. And so what we have is God's judgment in using creation upon both his son and upon those who actually crucify him, which is all of us. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out these words. So he does it at the end of that judgment, not at the beginning, to highlight that Jesus himself needs to go through this period of time where he is suffering the judgment of all humanity upon his own shoulders. And he yells out of words that come from Psalm 22. The first verse of Psalm 22 in the Hebrew is this transliterated into these English words here, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which you can see what it means there. And you ask the question, surely he knows the answer that he has been forsaken by God because of what he needs to die for, which is our sin. So why does he yell it out? I think he yells it out to highlight the emotional anguish and pain that exists between his father and himself. People often ask, where is God during my pain? Where is God during here? Did God go on holidays? He couldn't bear to watch. So he turned off the TV and turned his back to Jesus. I think that is incorrect. He is there with the son. He's experiencing the anguish with his son. The forsakenness of the son is not something that the father goes, yes, I'm happy with that. Like he's stoic and broad shoulders. We can take it, Jesus. Oh, I thought you could. The suffering a bit much. No, that's the opposite. In anguish, the communication of the darkness communicates the anguish of the son and the father as they experience and the son experiences in his own body and soul. Not merely the sin of humanity coming upon his shoulders, but the wrath of God and a relational shift that has never been experienced between the father and the son who have been in perfect communion together for all eternity. It's a hurt. It's a pain. You can tell the crowd don't get it. Maybe he's calling Elijah because Elijah's supposed to be this uh, portent man from the Old Testament because he didn't die. But come back, take the Messiah back to heaven or bring the Messiah back to earth to rule the world. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar to sort of lessen the pain, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone, they said, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. In other words, they're still not mocking this time in that sense, but their belief comes from a misunderstanding upon what Jesus is doing. But there's another loud cry in verse 37. And this is where the slithers of hope start to also break through with the spotlight. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Mark doesn't tell us what that loud cry is actually was. I'll hold it off for a few verses until the next section. But the next slither of hope is in verse 38. The curtain of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. That does two things. It's the judgment of God upon the old system that you needed to have the priest go in behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies in order to pay for the sins of the people. So you can imagine as all of the blood of those sheep as being and bulls as being absolutely scattered throughout Jerusalem, thousands of animals being slit with their throats and blood drained out. Jesus, with his death on the cross and through this split in the curtain, God is saying, that now is unnecessary. As Hebrew says, the blood of animals cannot take away the sin of man. And only does that by God's grace as a substitute. We need a real substitute who dies in my place. And that's the slither of hope in verse 38. And so if you watch a lot of TV shows and certain genres, you know, for example, I'm not a big fan of the procedural dramas with police and the like, but if you watch one at nine o'clock at night, by about 9.45, you know the plot twist is going to come. 
you know, you know it in the, the James Bond movies, don't you? That the evil man gets up and he spends a whole length of time pontificating about how his evil plan is going to be successful. And as soon as he starts talking about his evil plan, you know what's going to happen, don't you? He's a goner. <laughs> Where's the plot twist? It's not here, is it? The plot twist we would expect is not here. It ends the same as every single person who's ever lived. Death. Surely this man was the son of God. Past tense. Was. It means really a righteous person with the original language. Surely this man was a righteous person. In other words, he died, not like a criminal like these other people, but like a man who was innocent. But does it matter? They're all dead. Same result. Some of the women were watching from a distance. What are they doing? They're getting ready to go and take the body to Jesus. So it looks like that what you have at the end of this text, yes, is God's judgment upon Jesus, but he's still dead. And so where is the hope going to come from? We'll have our last reading now. The story ends with, like all people, dead, buried, gone. So where is our hope? We saw some slithers of hope, but in the end, death seems to be that ultimate leveler. Well, the hope itself comes in verse 37 and the reasons that Jesus himself no doubt yelled out Psalm 22. We all know the beginning of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me from saving me so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, said by King David. You may have felt similar at periods of times in your life. Where is God during my pain? Where was God during Jesus' pain? In verse 37, Jesus himself, with another loud cry, breathed his last. In the other Gospels, we hear what those words were. It is finished. Now, what is the it he's talking about? Is the it his life? That's part of it, isn't it? Because he breathed his last as his soul goes back to heaven, as his body lays in the tomb. But I think he's also referring to the end of the psalm that he first quoted. These are the last couple of verses of Psalm 22. All the ends of the earth, from verse 27, will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship, and all who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, which is, guess who? All of us, isn't it? All of us, no matter how much you strive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. What has he done? The it he is referring to in the psalm and in the crucifixion is that the separation from us to God has been done away with as that curtain foreshadowed. It is now open, split in two. It was a thick curtain, I tell you. You couldn't cut it with a pair of scissors. God absolutely sheared it clean in half to separate us from man. No, to bring us together through Christ by what he's done. Yes, he was buried, but already in the Good Friday message are the slithers of hope. And we're waiting for the final doing of the Lord Jesus. What has he done? Well, as the spotlight would turn back on us, we would see ourselves as people who have led our Lord to the slaughter, who did not deserve his love. But because of his love, he has brought us back. And the very heart in each of us that would have allowed Jesus to die, either in mundanity as we look on at the evening news and don't care, 
or as we maybe have done things in our own lives that we know we should be punished for but have not, like these people in the crowd. All of that sin is paid for by Christ. It is finished. The separation between you and God is over. But only if you come through Christ. Many of you will know the words that are in most funeral services. I did a funeral yesterday in the corollary passage of Psalm 23 with the next Psalm about the Lord is my shepherd is John 14. But Jesus himself says that he is going back to the father. And he says, well, how do I know Thomas says to him that you are speaking the truth. And he says, I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the father except through me. I am the way. So if you're here this morning and this familiar message has not rung true, let me implore you to continue to bring yourselves before our Lord because he is the only way for the sin of your own heart to be paid for. You can't pay it for yourself. You're not meant to. God pays for it and he's paid for it in his son and his son died willingly. Don't be so familiar with the cross. Don't rubbish the cross. Don't make it mundane in your life. So familiar that the reason for it is lost. He did it to bring you to God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Christ buried that humiliation of our own sin upon the cross. And Lord, we do look forward to Sunday, but we can see the slither of hope here, that as that temple was torn in two, the separation between us and God was done away with. And by faith in Jesus' blood, we are set free. As Galatians 5, 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It is for freedom. Let us live that free life out, trusting in Christ and what he's done. Amen.